people heard me, that's great. If you haven't found a seat um, for today, please come in and find a seat. And then as soon as you find a seat, I encourage you to stand up and join us. Psalm 117 says, Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples, for great is his love towards us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's do that together. to bring him praise come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace from the shifting shadows of the earth we will lift our eyes to him where steady arms of mercy reach to gather children in rejoice rejoice let every tongue rejoice one heart one voice O church of christ rejoice Come those whose joy is morning sun and those weeping through the night. Come those who tell of battles won and those struggling in the fight. For his perfect love will never change and his mercies never cease. But follow us through today. So give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders. His love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens. His love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. His love endures forever. Who made the great lights. His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day. His love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt. His love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them. His love endures forever. 
mighty hand and outstretched arm. His love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder. His love endures forever. And brought Israel through the midst of it. His love endures forever. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. His love endures forever. To him who led his people through the wilderness. His love endures forever. To him who struck down great kings. His love endures forever. And killed mighty kings. His love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites. His love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan. His love endures forever. And gave their land as an inheritance. His love endures forever. An inheritance to his servant Israel. His love endures forever. He remembered us in our low estate. His His love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies. His love endures forever. He gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. Give Give thanks thanks to the the God God of heaven. heaven. His love endures forever. Good morning. It was good to be together and enjoy our potluck last week. I I know that my brother said it was the best potluck he's been to and he wants to come every time we have one. So uh, maybe that's what happens after we've a year and a half of COVID and no potlucks. We went big. So it was a good time together and and, uh, thankful for that. Uh, Make sure you grab the card in your bulletin and fill that out. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Uh, If there's ways you want to get involved, if you want to get Pastor Michael's weekly email and you don't get that, things like that, uh, lets us know about that. If you're a visitor with us this morning, uh, it lets us know a little about who you are, and we're glad that you have joined us for our service this morning. Um, Just want to mention one thing. Uh, It's been in Pastor Michael's email, but in case you haven't seen it, uh, the McQueens are home from Turkey and from their... Uh, they're, they're back from their ministry there, and they're here uh, for a while, and we wanted to bless them with a gift basket. 
Um, and so it's in the office. And so if there's anything that you want to give towards that basket uh, as they kind of settle back into home and uh, recuperate, and it's just been a tough number of years for them, and we wanted to bless them. Uh, you can, we're taking it to them this week. Today it said in his email was the last day, but if you wanted to bring something later today or tomorrow, if you weren't aware of that, um, you can bring and drop that off with Erica in the office and we'll make sure that they get that. Uh, and then we'll, and since she's back from the future, uh, we'll invite Erwin to come make an announcement for us uh, this morning. All right, VBS starts tomorrow. Oh, come on. VBS starts tomorrow. Okay. Now, I need the kids, when I raise my hand, to say, woo! Can I hear that? Oh, come on, kids, louder. Woo! Okay. Now, when I put my hand down, I need the parents to say, yeah! Can I hear you, parents? Yeah! Okay, let's try this. Yeah! Yeah! Okay, got to get some excitement building for Time Lab VBS. And you know what? VBS is so fun. We do crafts, we have snacks, we play games, we learn about Jesus. And this year, we can't fit it all into five days. It's just too much. And so, if you see in your bulletins, we have a little announcement about VBS Connect. So the VBS fun is all next week, and then it's Sundays in August. So if you come at 9 a.m., Sundays in August, kids, you're gonna get breakfast, and then we're gonna have more VBS fun. <laughs> Parents, we're going to give you a chance to connect with some other parents after a year and a half of COVID. We thought you might need a chance to reconnect and reestablish some relationships or just have conversation with other adults, not through a screen, you know? <laughs> so that's starting Sundays, next Sunday, 9 a.m. here. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys during VBS week. And then all those Sundays, too. And if you are, last thing, if you're helping with VBS, right after the service, we're going to make our way back to room number three, and we're going to have a little meeting so I can go over the schedule and things with you. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, wasn't that supposed to just be the kids? I guess we're all somebody's kids, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you everyone. We're looking forward to a great week and next week then we're gonna have VBS Sunday So make sure you come back for that too uh, We're gonna get to hear and see a lot of what went on during the week and some of the songs and the skits and different things like that So we're excited about that. And we'll have hot dogs and cotton candy and inflatables out back like we've done in the past So make sure you come bring your families and uh, we're looking forward to a good time together uh, We're gonna invite Nick to come and pray for us at this time <laughs> Have you seen how many kids I have for breakfast? <laughs> have you seen the size of the refrigerator in my house? <laughs> all right, we're gonna pray for VBS. Lord, we do thank you for all the, all the effort that's been put into VBS, but um, more importantly, we're thankful that you are going to be there and that you want to know these kids and you want these kids to know you and you want to plant seeds that will grow as they grow and that they will become mature believers and a close relationship with you. And so that's specifically what we pray, Lord, that they would grow to know you in the most personal and awesome way so that they would never leave you and that they would always cling to you. And that the lessons and the truth and the experiments and all the, the things that they do next week would stick forever and that um, they would be able to pass it on again to the next generation if you don't come by then, Lord. So we just thank you again for this whole week that's coming up and then the, the following month of follow-up. We give it to you, we invite you to it all, and we're just looking forward to what you're gonna do. And we pray for energy for those of us that need to be there to help, that we can 
stick it out and be there for the kids and put our whole hearts into it. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> So we invite you to stand as we continue to worship him in song. Storms may wait for spring. 
in Deuteronomy 17, we read, when he is seated on his royal throne, he is to copy, uh, write a copy of this instruction for himself on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. It is to remain with him, and he is to read from it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to observe all the words of this instruction, and to do these statutes. Later in Deuteronomy, Moses continues, See today I have set before you life and prosperity, death and adversity. For I am commanding you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commands and statutes and ordinances, so that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God may bless you in the land you are entering to possess. as we turn to the word now that you would open our eyes to see and our hearts to hear the things you have for us this week. We ask the word that we ask you that the word would do its good work in us. God, that it would convict, teach, train, guide, encourage, that we may walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we have received. We pray this all in Jesus' precious name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Kids may be dismissed. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you all here this morning. I'm so glad to be able to be in the presence of other believers and to be in this place and worshiping the Lord together. If you would open your Bibles, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy 17. That is halfway through 34. So uh, we're, we're getting closer. I'm... Um, so excited to be going through the book of Deuteronomy. I've been thankful every time I study it and read it. The Lord is continuing to teach me more and more. Um, I just love God's Word. If you're new with us today, we just believe that this book is God's Word to us, and we, our, our practice is just to go through it and see what God has to say to us. And um, I, I figure that you need to know what God wants to say much more than you need to know what I think. And so... Uh, 
basically what we try to do is just let God talk through his word. I believe that that's what he wants to do. Um, it's exciting to see some of the VBS decorations. There were a whole bunch of time travelers here at the church this week um, putting up decorations. I'm really thankful for all the extra effort and those of you that have been helping Erwin out. Um, I'm excited about Erwin's enthusiasm. I'm not going to try any arm motions to get you to yell, but uh, that, that was a lot of fun too. But um, please be praying for VBS this week, that God would use it in a, in a mighty way in the hearts of the kids and, of course, in the hearts of the parents and entire families as well. So it's always a special week for us at our church, and uh, I'm excited about it. So please be sure and invite kids that you know in your neighborhood and um, let everyone know what's happening here. This morning, I uh, turned on my TV briefly because actually I wanted to find an Olympic basketball game and I didn't find it, but um, I happened to see Charles Stanley, my good old 88-year-old friend Charles Stanley, and uh, saw him preaching as he's been doing for decades, and he had a Bible open on the table in front of him as he was preaching, and it was just so encouraging to see a, a pastor have a Bible in front of him, and he actually read from it. And he actually talked about what it said, and it was so encouraging to me to see someone on TV that was teaching the truth and, and using the Word of God, and uh, I just delight in that. Andrew Jackson, former president, said, speaking of the Bible, said, that book, sir, is the rock on which our republic rests. That book is the rock on which our republic rests. Wow. Wow. George Washington said, it is impossible to righteously govern the world without God and the Bible. Without God and the Bible. What a great president. Ronald Reagan said, within the covers of one single book, the Bible, are all the answers to all the problems that face us today, if only we would read and believe. Well, a lot of great statements about the Bible. It's not only presidents that had things to say about the Bible, though. The great reformer Martin Luther said this, God is everywhere. However, he does not want you to reach out for him everywhere, but in his word. Reach out for it, and you will grasp him aright. Otherwise, you are tempting God and setting up idolatry. That is why he has established a certain method for us. This teaches us how and where we are to look for him and find him, namely, in the Word. In the Word. That was Martin Luther's great conviction. Well, last little tidbit about the Bible. I found a story. This was from Reader's Digest years ago. It said, when their son left for his freshman year at Duke University, his parents gave him a Bible, assuring him it would be a great help. Later, as he began sending them letters asking for money, they would write back telling him to read his Bible, citing chapter and verse. And he would reply that he was reading the Bible, but he still needed money. When he came home for the semester break, his parents told him they knew he had not been reading his Bible. Well, how did they know? Well, they had tucked 10 and $20 bills by the verses that they had cited in their letters to him. So he was caught. The Bible. Deuteronomy 17, the, Moses gives the children of Israel some instructions about various roles that people would hold in their nation, one of those being if they were to ever have a king in the future, which at this point they didn't, but when they had kings in the future, one of the things that Moses told them that that king was supposed to do was what Jessica read during the worship set there. They were to write a copy of God's laws and to keep it with them everywhere they went and read from it all the days of their life and practice what it said. That was God's expectation of the kings. We're going to see today three E's, not our normal three E's of exalt, equip, and extend, but three other E's this morning. We're going to see the evidence of witnesses, the edicts of priests and judges, and the expectations of of kings, the expectations of kings. Here in this section, as, as you remember now, the context of Deuteronomy, this is God's people who have been rescued from slavery in Egypt, been delivered from a horrible existence under the tyranny of Pharaoh, and, and brought into, or going to be brought into the promised land. But before they're able to enter into the promised land, we know that because of disobedience and lack of faith, they end up wandering in the wilderness for all these years. 
Deuteronomy is this point where they've been rescued out of Egypt, and they're being promised they're going into the promised land, but they're not there yet. And as I told you last week, that's the Christian life. That's where we're at right now, that we've been rescued from slavery to sin. We've been delivered. We've been ransomed. We've been promised a promised land in the future, but we're not there yet. We're right here. And this is the context of Deuteronomy. God wants to instruct His people how they are to live, how they're to function as a society, how they are intended to be distinct from the nations around them. Because of the evil, the wickedness, the abominations of the nations around them, God's going to kick those other nations out of that land and give it to His people Israel. So as He's preparing them for this, He is teaching them how they are to live, what their society is supposed to be like, how it's supposed to be ordered, and how it's supposed to function and, de- and deliver justice and righteousness. And that's what's going on here in Deuteronomy 17. So number one here is the evidence of witnesses. The evidence of witnesses, verses 1 through 7 of chapter 17. You shall not sacrifice to the Lord your God an ox or a sheep in which is a blemish, any defect whatever, for that is an abomination to the Lord your God. If there is found among you within any of your towns that the Lord your God is giving you a man or a woman who does what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God in transgressing His covenant and has gone and served other gods and worshipped them, or the sun, or the moon, or any of the host of heaven which I have forbidden, and it is told you, and you hear of it, then you shall inquire diligently. And if it is true and certain that such an abomination has been done in Israel, then you shall bring out to your gates that man or woman who has done this evil thing. And you shall stone that man or woman to death with stones. On the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses... The one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. The hand of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. Here, the evidence of witnesses. But starting in verse 1, he talks about the sacrifices that they're to bring to the Lord their God. And notice how there's this command here to not bring an ox or a sheep that has a blemish. This command is put here most likely because that would have been the temptation of some of the people as they were commanded on to bring sacrifices to the Lord, that it would have been easy for them to kind of look through their flock or their herd and go, oh, I could spare that one. (laughs) That one doesn't look very good. That one's, you know, kind of got a broken leg or whatever. That one's not going to be very good eaten or that one won't sell for very much. So I'll give that one as a sacrifice. That one's disposable, right? That might have been the temptation for the people of Israel to give Not necessarily their best, but to give what they thought they could spare. And here this command is given to make it clear to them that that's not the idea of a sacrifice. The idea of a sacrifice is to give the very best that you have. To give what you think you can't afford, what you think you can't spare. To give the first of what you receive, not the leftovers. And here he's giving them that command right from the beginning of this section. Notice that he says... um, an ox or a sheep that has a defect, that's an abomination to the Lord your God. That, that means it's something that God hates. When we give Him our leftovers, when we give Him second best, God is worthy of our very best, isn't He? And He wants to teach the children of Israel from the very beginning of their existence that they will demonstrate their understanding that, that they are utterly dependent upon God for everything that they have. And one of the ways they'll demonstrate that is by giving him of the first and the best of what they have. I was reading one commentator this week who who was a preacher and a writer in the 1800s in England. His name was C.H. McIntosh. I have no idea what the C.H. stands for. But uh, C.H. McIntosh said, Is there not in our private and public worship a deplorable lack of heart? A real a lack of real devotedness, deep-toned earnestness, holy energy, and integrity of purpose? 
Is there not a deplorable amount of cold formality and dead routine in our seasons of worship, both in the closet, meaning personal worship, and in the assembly? Well, he was reacting to what he saw in his day as worship that was not wholehearted. Uh, perhaps whether it was people at home or in the gathering of the church where it was lackluster, where it was going through the motions, routine, not full of heart and passion, emotion and love for God. And he was reacting to that. I wonder if he were alive today, if he would see the same thing in worship in our area, in our country, in our world today. And, that's, and he got that from the idea of, the, of giving God the, the leftovers, giving God the second best. And so the challenge here is that we would give God the first and the best and that we would have wholehearted worship. But then notice as he gets into verses 2 and 3, he talks about the man or the woman who goes off away from the covenant relationship with the Lord and begins to worship idols. That's what he's dealing with here. Worshiping idols or, or worshiping um, the stars or worshiping the moon. And he gives this instruction here about if anyone in your, in your town is, is um, guilty of that, then you're to bring them to the city gates and they are actually to be eliminated from the people by stoning. But he sets it up in such a way to make sure that there's justice in the way that they go about it. Now, there's two things about this. One is a reminder that they are in a covenant relationship with God, right? That they are distinct from the rest of the nations around them because God rescued them and established a covenant with them. And breaking that covenant was what was happening when people would go off and worship false gods. He wants them to understand how serious that is how devastating it will be for the entire society if they begin to allow that to continue, if they allow that to, to permeate their culture, their society. And he wants them to eliminate it right from the get-go. But he doesn't allow them, notice, he doesn't allow them to do that on the evidence of one witness. He requires that they would have two or three witnesses, which is interesting. This was probably to prevent the idea that someone gets mad at someone else, you know. They're arguing over their, their tent or something in their, in their village and they're upset with their neighbor and they can just go to Moses or go to the leaders of the town and say, hey, this person, I heard them whispering in their tent and they were praying to a false god. You know, if it's some way of trying to get back at someone or, or whatever, one witness could easily just say whatever they want to say. But here he's requiring there at least to be two or three witnesses. This is the idea of establishing a society where there's justice, where things are done in an orderly way, where there's righteousness. Of course, having two or three witnesses does not entirely prevent the possibility that those witnesses would not be telling the truth, but it's supposed to uh, eliminate the idea of just one person coming up with a false accusation. But we know as we get into the New Testament, there's this scene, this mock trial of our Lord when people stepped forward and, and made false accusations against Him. And it didn't take, it wasn't only one witness, it was multiple. And so it's always possible that, that someone can, that even though there'll be two or three witnesses, that they all could be false witnesses. Remember one of the commandments is you shall not bear false witnesses witness. And he's wanting to establish that here as a society. It's interesting when you look at what Jesus said about witnesses, though. I want to have you turn, if you would, to John chapter 8. I'll have one verse on the screen for you, but I want to read a section from there. John chapter 8, and look at verse 17. John chapter 8, verse 17, Jesus, speaking to the religious leaders, says, in your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. But what was the context? Why was Jesus saying that to them? Well, notice what he says back in verse 12. Much more familiar verse in John 8. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. 
They were saying, you're just one person. Remember, Moses said there has to be two or three witnesses. Verse 14, Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. Now, this is one of those things that Jesus said that would have upset the Pharisees tremendously. Verse 17, in your law it's written that the testimony of two people is true. And then verse 18, I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Jesus here in this section is saying that he is on a par with his father. That he, in other places, he said, I and my father are one. Here he's saying, I'm not just by myself testifying about myself. My father is here testifying about me too. I'm not one witness. I'm two the Father, and the Son. Jesus was the ultimate witness, but He appeals to them back to their law. Your, in your law, it's written that the testimony of two people is true. And Jesus says, I am here testifying, and so is my Father. Well, here they're establishing the idea of the evidence of witnesses so that they would be a lawful people and things would be done righteously. Number two now, the edicts of the priests and the judges. The edicts of the priests and the judges. Look at 8 through 13. If any case arises requiring decision between one kind of homicide and another, one kind of legal right and another, or one kind of assault and another, any case within your towns that's too difficult for you, then you shall arise and go up to the place that the Lord your God will choose. And you shall come to the Levitical priests and to the judge who is in office in those days, and you shall consult them, and they shall declare to you the decision. Then you shall do according to what they declare to you from the place that the Lord will choose. And you shall be careful to do according to all that they direct you, according to the instructions that they give you, and according to the decision which they pronounce to you, you shall do. You shall not turn aside from the verdict that they declare to you, either to the right hand or to the left. The man who acts presumptuously by not obeying the priest who stands to minister there before the Lord your God or the judge, that man shall die. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. There's a repetition. He had just said that a few verses before. And again, the, all the people shall hear and fear and not act presumptuously again. Like I said, here is God establishing amongst His people an orderly society. What happens when some sort of a system of justice is not established like this? It can be utter anarchy, right? In a, in a culture where there's not judges in place, where there's not an opportunity for someone to bring testimony, there's chaos. And here God is establishing with His people an orderly fashion for how they can, how they can um, take care of disputes, in amongst themselves. All these matters, all these controversies were to be settled by the people that God would establish in those positions as priests and as judges. Macintosh from the 1800s talking about this says, has this any voice for us? How are Christians to have their questions and their controversies settled? And he relates it to 1 Corinthians 6. If you want to turn there, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 9. Notice, if some of you might remember, we were in 1 Corinthians 6 a while back. And this is kind of how we would relate this in the New Testament age of what he's talking about here in Deuteronomy 17. 1 Corinthians 6, starting at verse 1. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? 
So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there's no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded, but you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers? On that section, Paul is challenging the church. Remember, this is the early stages of the church there in Corinth as well. And he's wanting to establish with them that they should be able to dis uh, settle disputes amongst each other. They shouldn't have to go to the outside. They shouldn't have to go to unbelievers who do not understand God's ways. They should be able, because of God's Spirit with them and the fact that they're brothers and sisters in Christ, to settle matters amongst each other. And Paul was challenging the church in Corinth because they'd gotten into the habit of suing one another, of disputing one another, and taking their arguments out into the world before worldly courts. Well, similarly, in Deuteronomy 17, God is wanting them to establish justice amongst each other, the ability to have wisdom and to have people put in place who can make wise judgments about the disputes that they might have amongst each other. What is he doing here? He's establishing a just and orderly society. And any society that pays attention to the words of God will be set up in a way where it's not just total chaos, but will be set up in a way that's righteous and works and protects the innocent. And that's what God is doing here. Some of us are reading through the one-year Bible right now, and we're in 2 Chronicles. And there's a couple of verses that we'll get to later this week in 2 Chronicles, such as um, chapter 19, verse 8. I think we might have that on the screen for you, perhaps. 2 Chronicles 19, 8. Moreover, in Jerusalem, Jehoshaphat appointed certain Levites and priests and heads of families of Israel to give judgment for the Lord and to decide disputed cases. They had their seat in Jerusalem. And then in verse 10, whenever a case comes to you from your brothers who live in their cities concerning bloodshed, law, or commandment, statutes, or rules, then you shall warn them that they may not incur guilt before the Lord, and wrath may not come upon you and your brothers. Thus you shall do, and you will not incur guilt. So here we see when Jehoshaphat was king that he was actually following what God had told them to do in Deuteronomy 17. That he was establishing judges who, who could make decisions about various disputes that were going on. So at least in this case, they were following what God had established for them in his word. In Psalm 122 verse 5, it's even part of the song that they sing as this Psalm 122 is a song of ascent. Uh, rejoicing in the fact that the people get to go to the house of the Lord to worship. And talking about Jerusalem, he says, there thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. That's even in their songbook. The Psalms is the songbook of the Hebrew people. They even sang about the fact that God established judges. Why would they sing about that? Why would that be something that they would rejoice in? Because God had helped them to establish a society that was just and orderly and made sense. And, and the same thing is true like we talked about when we were in 1 Corinthians, that God desires that His church would be a place where things are done in an orderly way, where where people respect one another, love one another, where disputes can be settled amongst each other and not taken out into the world, where we can set an example for the outside world by the way that we do things with excellence and in an orderly fashion because that shows what kind of a God we worship because He's a God of order, a God of justice, a God of righteousness. He's not a God of chaos. He's not, he's not a God of, uh, of the circus. So God's people in Israel and God's people in His church are to operate in a way that models who God is. And He's just. He's righteous. He's orderly. He's not chaotic. He makes sense. 
But then notice in verses 12 and 13, they talk again about this person who acts presumptuously, who doesn't obey the priest or the judge when they make a decision. That, he says, that man shall die. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. He's wanting the people of Israel to be a cleansed people. And so if there's someone that's blatantly evil, disobeying the commands of God, following after idols, God doesn't want to just wink at that or sweep that under the rug. God wants them to purge the evil from their midst so that they will be a holy people. It's the same principle in the New Testament in the church. Why does the church, like for example in Matthew 18, why is it describe the, the process of church discipline? The process of someone being a part of the church but then being put out of the church. He talks about it in 1 Corinthians as well. Being put out of the church. Why? Because God wants His church to be holy. God wants His church to be distinct. And so, there's this process set up so that the evil will be purged from His people. But notice also verse 13, the people shall hear and fear and not act presumptuously again. The idea that the punishment for the crime would deter others from wanting to follow suit, right? And there are some today that say that that's not a thing, but it's a thing. <laughs> when someone sees someone else being punished, it, it usually has the effect of deterring them from wanting to follow the same steps. They see someone not listening to the priest and the judge and getting eliminated. It's going to make them think twice about doing the same thing. That's why I, I had an older sister, three and a half years older than me. I learned from the trouble that she got into. And I found ways to, to sneak around and hide the things that I was doing so that I wouldn't get in trouble, unfortunately. I'm no, just kidding. But I did learn from watching the trouble she got into and thinking, I don't want to go there. And here he's saying to the people of Israel that there's going to be a deterring effect when you deal harshly, severely, and completely with the evil in your midst. Prevent the others from wanting to follow in the same steps. So those are the edicts of the priests and the judges. And then third, and finally, the expectations of kings. This is really interesting to me that so many, so many years before Israel would even have their first king, God lays down these guidelines. Verse 14, when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. Remember, that's what they said before Saul was made king. That's exactly what they said. Verse 15, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. Whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself. Or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself. Solomon, are you listening? He shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him and he shall read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Long before Israel would clamor for a king of their own and God would allow them to have a king and God would choose a king for them, he established these guidelines for them in preparation for that time. Remember, they're not even in the promised land yet. They are God's people, but they're not yet in God's place. They're on the precipice of it, but they're not there yet. But even before they get there, He wants to lay out for them, this is what your king is to do, and this is what he's to not do. 
This is what your king is to be like. And this is what he's not to be like. And then think about the kings, especially the first three kings. It was definitely a king that God chose. He says here, the Lord your God will choose. Saul, chosen by God to, to be the king. Did he follow all of these expectations that God laid out for the king? No. Saul got into so much trouble that God removed him from the place of kingship and gave the throne to David, whom God also chose, remember. God chose David from all the sons of Jesse and gave him the throne. And then we also learn that God chose David's son Solomon to be the one that would build his temple. But then you think about Solomon. What if Solomon would have lived out the command here in verse 18 through, verses 18 through 20. The, the king was told here he was supposed to write out this law, which, you know, there's, there's something about writing God's word down that helps you remember it, those of you that journal. He was told to write out. He was to write the law of God himself, it looks like. And then it was to be approved by the Levitical priests. And then notice, he's supposed to have it with him wherever he goes. He's supposed to read in it all the days of his life. He's supposed to do what it says, keep the words of the law. What if Solomon would have done that? It's interesting, isn't it? He blatantly disobeys everything that God laid out for a king here. Here they're told not to, uh, not to accumulate a lot of horses. Well, did you read about Solomon? <laughs> How many horses? And there's, there's verses about even in, in First Chronicles about, um, about him going to Egypt or sending off people to Egypt to bring back horses. And they also sent them to... Um, it says, well, I'll find the verse for you. Second Chronicles 1.16, Solomon's import of horses was from Egypt, which was south of Jerusalem, and from Ku, which is Tarsus, actually, which is to the north of Jerusalem. Solomon sent his people to the north and to the south all over the place to accumulate for him many horses. Why? That was a, a sign of military power, having a lot of horses. Also, we read about him um, accumulating wealth, more wealth than anyone had ever seen before. Remember, the queen of Sheba came to check out Solomon and to listen to his wisdom, and she was in awe. Talk about a shock and awe campaign, you know, for, for her to see all that Solomon had was just blew her away. And the, he was doing exactly what God told him not to do what God told Israel not to have their kings do, to accumulate horses and gold and silver, but then the, the top of the list would be to not acquire many wives for himself. And we're told in the Scripture that Solomon had 300 wives and 700 concubines. That's a thousand women. And God... <laughs> I'm not going to say it. No, I'm not going to say it. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> I mean, how do you keep a thousand women happy? <laughs> but the problem was not that he couldn't keep all these women happy. The problem was that they led his heart astray, right? And we're told very clearly. Isn't it interesting that exactly what God said would happen is what actually happened? in Israel's history? Go figure. God says something, it actually comes true. But this is actually disturbing because this is the, this is the downfall of Israel. The downfall of Judah was the fact that they had kings that didn't do what God told them to do. Or they did what God told them not to do. And it all stems from verses 18 through 20 that they didn't pay attention to the words of God. It's not like Solomon had never heard these words. It's not like Solomon would have been shocked that God didn't want him to accumulate 
many wives. He would have known. It's not that he would have been stunned by these requirements. He would have heard of them. It was that he ignored them. That he knew what was right and he knew what was wrong and he did what he wanted to do anyway. And it's not just Solomon. I mean, the kings get worse and worse and worse as you go through the book of Kings, right? They just, bad king, bad Israel. And then every once in a while they have good king, good Israel. And then bad king, bad Israel, right? As the leader goes, so go the people. And if they would have just did what God said, they never would have had a bad king. They could have had all good kings if they would have just paid attention to Deuteronomy 17. And America would never have a bad president if they actually listened to, believed, and followed Deuteronomy 17. Is Deuteronomy important today? Oh my goodness gracious. If only, if only there was a king that listens to God's words and obeys. Look at the history of Israel's kings stumbling and falling over and over and over again. And as you read through the, the books of Samuel, as you read through the Kings, as you read through the Chronicles, there's something in your heart that is, that is starting to cry out, oh, if only, if only there would be a good king. If only there would be a king that would do what God says. If only there would be a king who would follow the commands of the Lord. And then you get into the New Testament and you see this king, who accumulated no monetary resources for himself. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He didn't even have a house. He didn't have money. He didn't have a large bank account. He didn't obviously accumulate many wives. He didn't have even one wife. He didn't do any of these things. He didn't acquire horses. He didn't have a great military. Remember, he allowed the disciples to, to bring along a couple of swords, and he said, that's enough. And then when Peter pulled his out, Jesus said, Nah. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. If only there would be a king that would come along, and there was. Finally, the hero of the story, the king of all kings, is the one who came along and obeyed God's words perfectly and lived as a king was supposed to live and lived in such a way that people could look up to him and emulate their lives after him. The question I have for you today, as you look around and see all of the, the wicked leaders that we have in our world today, all the people that constantly disobey God's will, God's words, God's ways, as you look around and you're disgusted with the leadership in our world today, have you settled on the fact that Jesus Christ is your king? Is Jesus Christ the king of your heart today? Is he the Lord of your life? Is he the leader that you look to? Is he the one that you put your trust in? No elected official, just Jesus. Is he your king today? Because he's the only one. He's the only king that followed every command of God perfectly. And he did it all for you. And he did it all for me. And even though Jesus was the perfect king of all kings, he was treated as a criminal. And he was put on a cross. He was treated as a criminal so that you and I, who actually are criminals, could be forgiven and set free and experience real life. 
Is Jesus your king? I'd want to challenge you today that if you are listening to these words and you're not sure that Christ is your king, but that you've been following someone or something else, maybe you've been following yourself, maybe you've been on the throne of your heart. If that's you today, I want to challenge you to turn your life over to Jesus Christ and to do it today and to say to Jesus and to mean it, you are my king and you are my only king. And come into my life. Be my Lord. Forgive me of my sin. I want to follow you today. If that's you today, I'd want to encourage you to do that. Even while we're singing this final song that says those very words, you are my king. And maybe today you need to come forward and pray and get right with the Lord even as we sing this final song. Would you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the warnings of your word for the, the ways that you wanted to establish justice and righteousness among your people. And thank you for the instructions you gave your people about what a king was supposed to be like. And Lord, thank you for, the, for what we see in Scripture that teaches us that there's only one. There's only one good king. There's only one perfect king. There's only one leader worth following. And it's you, Lord Jesus. God, I pray that you would forgive us for the ways that we've put our trust and our hope in other people and in other things instead of in you alone. And Father, if there's anyone here today that maybe for the first time needs to commit their life to you and call upon you as their Lord, as their King, as their God, that they would do that today. You would draw them to yourself. They would open their heart to you confess their sins and experience your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy. Lord, we ask that you would help us to live our lives following after this one perfect king. May we be people that, that model our lives after you, after you alone, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we invite you to stand. Join us as we sing to this um, perfect king.
Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. Let's live for him this week. God bless you. Don't forget the VBS meeting, Classroom 3.